As psychologists, we tend to assume that there are reasons for behavior. And we tend to sort those reasons or causal factors into two categories. On the one hand is biology, also known as nature. This suggests that you act the way you do because of your genetic makeup and other biological processes. On the other side are arguments that your behavior is shaped by the experiences that you have during a lifetime. This is known as nurture. But very few psychologists think behaviors are entirely nature or entirely nurture. In reality, it's a combination. This debate is, for any given behavior, exactly how much was that particular behavior influenced by nature and how much by nurture. The PsychBoost flashcard app has a new feature. Test yourself with over 1,500 multiple choice questions, including every topic on A-level or GCSE psychology. Try paper one for free right now. And Patreon supporters can watch PsychBoost videos ad-free, learn from over 17 hours of exclusive exam tutorial videos, and access hundreds of digital and printable resources, including mind maps, quiz sheets, worksheets, teaching slides, and more. The nature-nurture debate. The nature-nurture debate is an argument about the extent to which behaviors are due to the influence of nature, which means inherited genes, or nurture, which are environmental factors. I want to fix a common misconception early on. We need to be really clear that the debate is about the relative importance of each of these, nature and nurture. This debate assumes there's a combination of both factors in determining behavior. So now, hopefully you won't make the mistake of thinking the debate is if behavior is just due to nature or just due to nurture. Students often get confused and think psychologists only choose one side or another and then fight it out. But you would actually find very, very few psychologists coming down completely on the nature side or the nurture side of any argument about behavior. But the confusion is understandable, as when teaching psychology, we try to explain a clearly defined biological approach and behaviorist approach. In reality, even behaviorists accept the role of biology and actually include it in their theories. Primary reinforcers include food and sex. These primary reinforcers are biological in nature, and animals are born with those drives. The dogs in Pavlov's experiment didn't need to be trained to drool to the food. The important contribution from behaviorists is that animals learn associations and the consequences of behavior, or that secondary reinforcers ultimately lead to accessing primary reinforcers. Biological psychologists argue behavior is due to the inheritance of genes, such as genes for brain formation. But these biological processes interact with the environment. For example, biological psychologists accept early trauma and deprivation can influence the developing brain, creating a vulnerability to later mental health conditions, or that the brain is plastic, physically adapting in response to experiences and learning. But while the vast majority of psychologists take a complex view about the origins of behavior, assuming an interaction between nature and nurture, each extreme side of the nature-nurture debate has a philosophical origin. A French philosopher called Descartes is associated with the nature side of the debate. He was known as a nativist, which is the idea that the mind is born with certain innate ideas rather than learned through experience. Descartes thought that these innate ideas were the foundation of all knowledge and understanding. Descartes was born in the 16th century, so he had no idea about DNA. But he did argue that this innate knowledge was passed down the bloodline through biological hereditary. John Locke is on the nurture side of the debate. He was an English philosopher who was one of the founders of empiricism. Empiricism is the idea that knowledge is acquired through experience and observation, rather than being innate. Locke believed that the mind is tabula rasa at birth, a blank slate ready to be written on. Locke argued all knowledge and understanding is acquired through experience. He believed that sensory experiences shape the mind, and that the mind develops through accumulating these experiences. When it comes to psychological explanations of behaviour you may have studied on your course, close to Descartes' native sphere of behaviour, we can include any theories that suggest behavior has its origin in genetics. So, the genetic explanation for OCD. That individuals inherit a vulnerability to OCD, such as a faulty cert gene. This alters serotonin transport leading to the symptoms of OCD. But also the MOA gene theory of aggression. The genetic explanation for schizophrenia. Balby's monotrophic theory, which suggests babies are born with an innate need to attach to a mother figure. Also, any evolutionary theory such as that for mate selection and aggression. All of these arguments suggest genes code for behaviors, and those adaptive behaviors are selected for and passed on. When looking across your course of theories that are closest to Locke's empiricist theory, 
we could suggest the cupboard love fear of attachment. Babies come to learn their mothers give them food, so the babies become attached to their mothers. Sticking with attachment, Ainsworth's classification of babies into secure and insecure types assumes that babies develop their attachment style due to the sensitive responsiveness of their mother. Behaviourists suggest phobias are due to an association forming during a traumatic experience. But while these biological or behavioural psychologists argue that their ideas are the main driving force behind the observed behaviours, they're not saying it's the only driving force. Interactionalism. To fully explain the nature-nurture debate, we need to mention interactionalism. This is the idea not just that there's a relative importance of nature and nurture factors in behaviour, but genes and environment actually work together. They influence each other as they interact. One example of interactionalism is the diaphesis stress explanation, which is often used to explain mental health conditions such as OCD and schizophrenia. This is the idea that individuals inherit a genetic vulnerability to developing a mental health condition, which is the diaphesis, but they don't actually go on to express the disorder unless they experience a traumatic event, which is the stressor. When it comes to the increased level of aggression to young males, it could be due to an interaction between evolutionary forces that historically meant young men needed to prove their physical ability and bravery by hunting and warfare. These biological processes interact with the social and cultural forces around gang membership and risky behaviour. So, not all young males are aggressive, but have the potential if exposed to certain experiences and cultural norms as they grow up. This would explain why we don't see the same level of violent aggression in young females who grow up in a similar cultural environment. A quick warning before moving on to the evaluations. Both the nature and nurture perspectives are deterministic arguments, meaning both sides of the debate argue behaviour as a cause, either in the environment or in the genes. You can mention this, but if you do, try not to turn this into an essay about determinism, or you might lose focus on the nature-nurture debate. Discussion points. We can use examples from across the A-level to support each perspective when discussing nature and nurture. It might be useful to show two explanations of the same behaviour, such as explanations of attachment. You can go into detail about the diaphesis stress response, or you can talk about the approaches. I think psychodynamics is a good example of interactionalism. After all, Freud claimed all children experience psychosexual stages of development at around the same age, and these are innate processes. But what's important to Freud is how these stages combine with unique life experiences a child has while passing through each of these stages. This then results in the adult personality and anxieties. But as I've given a range of examples you can use during the first part of this video, I'm going to spend the rest of this video explaining some other, slightly more complex discussion points. The use of twin studies and research demonstrates the complexity of interaction between nature and nurture. Identical or monozygotic twins share 100% of their DNA, and dizygotic twins or non-identical twins share 50% of their genes. Researchers will often measure the concordance rate of mental health conditions in twins. Concordance is the likelihood of one individual having a condition if another related individual has a condition. Interestingly, the concordance rate is higher for monozygotic twins than dizygotic twins for both OCD and schizophrenia, which would suggest that the increased risk is due to the increased genetic similarity. But neither condition has 100% concordance, what you'd expect if a condition was entirely genetic in origin. This suggests that there's an interaction between genes and the environment. Taking a dichotomous view of behaviour, that behaviour is entirely due to innate or environmental factors, and focusing on one cause, can have an advantage in the development of treatments. Assuming OCD is solely due to the inheritance of genes that influence serotonin transport in the brain, taking a fully nature explanation, results in the development of SSRIs as a drug therapy for OCD. However, we can argue the most successful treatment for OCD is often a combination therapy of SSRIs and CBT, again showing the effectiveness of taking an interactionalist approach. There are implications of accepting behaviour as being primarily due to nature or nurture. When it comes to mental illness, suggesting that someone is unwell due to environmental reasons can be seen as empowering the sufferer, as they can take an active role in altering their thought processes, rather than a passive role if we accept a purely biological explanation. When it comes to the legal system, Adrian Rain suggests that if we accept aggressive behaviour as mainly due to biological forces shaped by genetics, this could lead to arguments to reduce the sentences of criminals with certain gene markers. After all, they're not responsible for the aggressive genes. Or, we may be able to identify and intervene on individuals who may become violent in the future. Finally, 
it used to be thought that our genes were set in stone. And while it's true the genetic code itself remains stable, a very interesting way the environment can influence gene expression has been discovered. This is a process called epigenetic modification. Our DNA has chemical marks that influence how the DNA is expressed, so certain genes can be switched on or switched off. This collection of chemical marks is our epigenome. While environmental experiences can alter this epigenome, especially in children, positive life experiences like supportive relationships and a stimulating environment, and negative experiences like exposure to toxins or stress, can alter how genes are expressed in brain cells, either negatively or positively influencing behaviour in later life, affecting mental health and learning. It's even been shown that the experiences of parents can influence the epigenome of their infants. Again, this shows the close interaction between innate and environmental factors. I want to thank everyone over on Patreon for supporting the channel. Because of you, I've been able to teach part-time, meaning I can make Psych Boost on YouTube for everyone. I do have extra resources that are exclusive for my patrons, so if you've decided to sign up, you can grab those over on my website. And these include over 100 exam question tutorial videos. Of course, including questions on the Issues and Debates unit. I hope this was helpful, and I will see you in the next Psych Boost video.